half a century, I've focused on foundations of reality. Though I stress science, I hold open the possible existence of God or something like God as the foundation of reality. I've immersed myself in the philosophical theology of the essence, nature, and traits of God, if there be a God. I'm enjoying the journey, but where am I going? I have not examined the myriad God claims of various religions. Am I, so to speak, leaving stones unturned? Sure, I'd be shocked if any sectarian doctrine were absolute truth, but I'm obsessive enough to fret that I could be wrong. There is a backstop benefit to the journey. How we justify religious beliefs gives insight into the human psyche. In the West, Christianity is so common that our ears have become dull to its flabbergasting, some would say preposterous, claims. Take the Incarnation. God, the Creator, becomes Jesus, a human being. God does something shocking with the person Jesus, unites, combines, conjoins, merges, fuses, blends, accompanies, admixtures. I need to learn the proper verb. How could divine nature with human nature fill in one of those verbs? How could the incarnation work? One need not be a Christian or even a theist to appreciate the puzzle. What's the incarnation? I'm Robert Lawrence Kuhn, and Closer to Truth is my philosophical inquiry. If there is a God, and that God created the universe, to imagine that such a supreme being became in some serious sense a human being? On a mid-sized planet orbiting a mediocre star in an undistinguished minor spiral arm of an unremarkable spiral galaxy is either, as Christians say, the greatest story ever told or the pinnacle of fanciful, arrogant, pre-scientific, human-centric mythology. That's the Incarnation. I find myself with a mild aversion to the term for whatever reason. Non-Christian upbringing, scientific education, distaste for religious ritual. But overcoming bias is good. So how do we examine the Christian claim seriously? Subject the incarnation to the rigors of analytic philosophy, especially the demand of internal consistency. I know precisely where to begin. I go to one of the world's leading centers for philosophical and analytic theology, Scotland, St. Andrews University, the Logos Institute. They're holding a workshop on the incarnation. I meet a Christology expert, the Regis Professor of Divinity at Cambridge, Ian McFarland. Ian, I have to ask how the incarnation works. At one level, how it works is finally a mystery. But there have been conceptual moves that have been made to attempt to at least show a fundamental kind of coherence about it. The most fundamental one, I suppose, is the distinction between nature and person. Nature refers to what a thing is, carness for a car, catness for a cat, humanity, and God has a nature, God's being with the various attributes that God possesses. Person has to do with who someone is. So what I am as a human being, who I am is Ian McFarland. What is claimed in the incarnation is that God, who is for Christians eternally three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, assumes a human life uh, and lives a human life. So that Jesus of Nazareth, who is in terms of his humanity, completely human, just like you and me, you cut him, he bleeds, he can cry, all those sorts of things. Who he is, is the second person of the Trinity, is God. So that when you shake Jesus' hand, you're shaking God's hand. This human life, which is truly a human life, is God's life. Did Jesus have to have compartmentalized parts of his mind? No, Jesus' life was entirely and fully human life. What he knew and what he learned, he learned and knew as growing up in Nazareth and figuring it out like everybody else does. It's simply that in doing that, God was saying that life is my life, so that everything he does is During my life. During that earthly time yeah. of 30 years plus uh, mm -hmm. that Jesus was on earth, 
There was only, uh, if you believe in eternity, there was only two persons of the Trinity there? No. The way in which the traditional Christian teaching on the uh, incarnation runs is that the two natures are combined in one person, that is one person instantiates, one identity is simultaneously living two different sorts of existences, a divine existence and a human existence. They do it without confusion or change. They do it also without division or separation. Jesus isn't a combination of divinity and humanity. And I think Jesus, as the second person of the Trinity in his divine nature, is running the universe in perfect cooperation with the Father and the Son. But that sounds like a, a, a toy incarnation, because if I'm still independent and still existing in my eternal uh, sonhood as number two in the Trinity, it, it sounds like it's a phony kind of incarnation because whatever happens to that, I've still got my, my divine... Uh... Well, it's, it's part to understand what does it mean for God to create a world? God gives rise to a world that in every respect is utterly dependent on God's power at all times, and it's not a toy. Uh, the claim of the incarnation is that when Jesus dies, it is true to say that God dies, albeit, again, using traditional categories, according to his human nature. The divine nature can't die. But nevertheless, death is now something that is predicated of the who that is the second person of the Trinity. That's an element. But if Jesus were not resurrected, yep. Yep. ever, yep. what would happen to the second person of the Trinity? Nothing? Nothing. Okay. I mean, this, well, I shouldn't say that. So the second person of the Trinity is not at risk because the second person of the Trinity, in, insofar as he holds the divine nature, is immortal and isn't subject to death. Now, if Jesus hadn't been resurrected, what that would have meant effectively, as far as I can see, is that God, in condemning sin in Jesus, condemns the world as a whole. That the world then uh, relates to God and quite differently is something God ultimately refuses to affirm, refuses to bring back, refuses to bind ultimately to God's own self and simply throws into into perdition, into nothingness. But God could have done, yes, God could have done that. God, was, God did not have to save the world. Uh, the, one could imagine, I suppose, the incarnation becomes simply a big, a, a throne of judgment and nothing else. God's coming down and showing the utter corruption and vacuousness of human existence and sin and letting it go to its own end. Uh, but that's not the point of what God was doing there, hence the resurrection. While I appreciate why the divine nature cannot be subject to death, I'm still troubled if the incarnation carried no risk. A sham death, as it were, pardon my candor, feels like a cheat. The appearance of death, but not the reality? The driver here is the wages of sin is death, so a death is demanded. But a sham death wouldn't seem to support the incarnation's momentous claim of expiating sin. But a real death would mean that God dies, which is impossible. So, neither sham nor real death works, then nothing works. Is the concept incoherent? This brings me back to the perennial problem of how divine nature and human nature can coexist in the same person at the same time. I ask a Catholic philosopher of religion, who explores metaphysical mechanisms of theological claims, Timothy Paul. One person of the Blessed Trinity, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the person of the Son, became a man. And the way that the ecumenical councils of the church, the great definitions given by these groups of bishops who met in the early church, the way they define it is this. There is a divine nature shared by those three persons. And there are human natures. You have your body, soul, composite, I have my own body, soul, composite. Each one is a nature. And what the second person of the Trinity did when he became incarnate was assume or take on or unite himself to one of these human natures. And so he became man in the same sense that I'm a man. We normally think anything that's God has to have certain attributes true of it. God can't be uh, ignorant. God can't be weak. God, uh, oftentimes people think God can't change. God's outside of time. God is necessary. But anything human has the opposite of those things. Humans are ignorant, we're weak in lots of ways, we can change. So the, the councils teach that God became man, one person, Jesus Christ, is God and is man. And it seems clear to us that anything that's God has these attributes true of it, but anything that's man doesn't have those attributes true of it. So you'd have one thing, God and man, who's both passable and impassable, mutable and immutable, omnipotent and weak and so on and so forth, all down the line. Yeah, and each one of those sound like contradictions. Absolutely. 
And so lots of ink has been spilt by Christians mm-hmm. trying to figure out how to make that, those not contradictions. Right, right. And so there are many ways to do it. A couple of them go like this. One is to say, well, he's not really impassable after all. We thought God was impassable or immutable or take your pick, but we'll peel those predicates off the divine nature. He's not really those ways. What I'm trying to do in my work is assume the teachings of the church and see what happens, which include the teachings that God's impassable. Right. So from Nothing in effect, God, God doesn't change. God's not in time. Another way you do it is this. They say, well, God is impassable, immutable, all the rest. When he comes to earth as man, he sheds off those divine prerogatives while he's on earth. So he changes himself to not be that powerful. Yeah, it's not my view. Oh, okay. yeah. it's good, just, I'm good. setting up for my view. Okay. Showing all these other ones that don't work. Okay. You can't say he doesn't have the attributes. You can't say, well, he has them for a while, then he doesn't have them, then he has them right. again. you got to say he has them. So then you have two main approaches you can take. One, main, one of them is, this, is to say this, he's passable and he's impassable, or take your pick. Those are just two examples. He's mutable and he's immutable, but not in the same way. That's one response. A second response is- That sounds like cheating, but- <laughs> Yeah. Okay. And another way is to say, well, actually, the way you properly define these predicates, they're not really incompatible at all. And then you give a logical account of how to define them so that there's no inconsistency. Is that where you go? That's where I go. Okay. If you define the words, and here I normally use passable and impassable. If something is passable, it can be affected like me and you. If it's impassable, it can't be. Normally, those terms are defined as follows. Something is impassable if and only if nothing can ever affect it, period. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's passable if and only if something could affect it at some point. And I think if you define it like that, it's a clear contradiction. The game is over. Uh, <laughs> right. And you find the council saying in one sentence, they had this beautiful sentence, five contradictions in a row. One in the same person, Jesus Christ our Lord, is passable and impassable, mutable and immutable. Five times they say these. So I don't think they were foolish people doing these councils. So I think they just could not have meant that initial truth condition I gave you, the conditions of being changeable for passable and unchangeable for impassable because it'd just be an obvious, odious contradiction, and they were too smart for that. So it's got to be another meaning there for these terms. And here's the meaning I like. If it's something is passable when it has a nature that can be affected, and something is impassable when it has a nature that can't be affected. Now, for me and you, we only have one nature. By nature, we mean something like a substance, an, an ousia in the Greek. The divine nature is the divine substance. It's not a, a system like, like, he, like uh, the nature of the world. It's a thing. And a human nature is this concrete flesh and bone sort of thing. And so you're passable if you have one of these, and you're impassable if you have one of those. And uh, Christ fulfilled both those truth conditions, having a nature of this type and a nature of that type. And so it's apt to say of him both things. He's passable and he's impassable on my view of the terms. Nice move, Tim, seeking to resolve the contradiction by segregating, as it were, the opposing traits. But then, how could the two natures, divine and human, in any way combine? This is no micro-detail. This is the beating heart of the Incarnation Doctrine. A valiant effort, but if this be analytic philosophy's best case for defending the Incarnation, I must ask, could there be other ways? I asked the professor of New Testament and early Christianity at St. Andrews, the former Bishop of Durham, N.T. Tom Wright. We tend to assume we know what the word God means, and then we puzzle about fitting Jesus into that. The New Testament insists that we should do it the other way around. John, at the end of his prologue in verse 18, says, he says, no one has ever seen God, the only begotten Son or God, who is in the bosom of the Father or close to the Father's heart. He has made him known. And, and Colossians says exactly the same thing. Paul in Colossians 1.15 says, he, Jesus, is the image of the invisible God. In other words, if you want to know w- what God is, who God is like, then look at Jesus. And that's scary. It means putting on hold the automatic assumptions that we have about the meaning of the word God. And the Christian view is that actually the word God is a question mark and that the way in is by looking at Jesus. And then all sorts of questions actually come up quite differently, like the whole question of what was creation like and how did it happen, etc. Well, what was Jesus like? What did, he went around telling stories about a farmer sowing seeds and some went to waste and some had a great harvest right. and so on. Now, supposing 
that's how the cosmos began with mm. with a god who was doing stuff and some of it yeah that didn't work that way but some of it that there's almost a playfulness about it and that may or may not be right but i'm just what i'm trying to do is to loosen right. one's grip well, on the idea nice. that we know who god is and in, in, in terms of the the yeah. causal direction well yeah. you're, you're 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 flipping the causal or direction the, the, or the, the nature the, of the, the question but, and this is this is where of course history really matters because if somebody comes along and says well jesus of nazareth never existed or jesus of nazareth may have existed but he didn't do any of the things that the Bible says he did, then obviously you'd have a problem. And that's why history really does matter. And it's as though that's the risk of Christian theology. And it's the risk mm. which Christian theology says that God himself took. Supposing Jesus had been run over by a camel on the road to Jericho, <laughs> said, I can't help feeling the entire structure of Christian theology might have been different. <laughs> so there's a sense of, of almost a, a risky playfulness about the New Testament picture of God, because it's got this lively, energetic, surprising, and ultimately crucified human being in the middle of it. I have to tell you that in speaking to philosophers of religion, I get a dramatically different picture. I bet you do. I bet you do. Yeah. <laughs> and they have these perfect being theology. Yeah, yeah, and when yeah, you yeah. start with perfect being theology yeah, and then yeah. work your way down, it's a very different and picture. I want to know, where do you get that perfect being from? How do, how do, how do you know what a perfect being is? For a Christian, um, you get the answer to that by looking at Jesus. But unless the New Testament is totally wrong, then Paul is saying, Hebrews is saying, Revelation is saying, John is saying, look at Jesus and figure it out backwards as it were from mm. there. Now here's the thing, John is obviously writing a new Genesis, in the beginning, yeah, etc., yeah, creation, yeah, light, yeah. darkness, and the climax of John's prologue is the word became flesh, logos sarxagenito. Genesis is about the creation of a temple, heaven and earth is temple language. The last thing you put into the temple is an image of the God mm -hmm. so that the world around can see who the God is and worship and so that the power and presence of the God will be there. So when God puts into his cosmos, according to Genesis, this humans, you and me, male and female, this is a way of saying that's how God wants to be known in the world. John is picking up exactly that and saying the word became flesh and that's how the true God wants to be known in the world. Yeah. Okay, so let's use your epistemological direction, starting with Jesus and going back to God. Uh, w what are the kinds of things that we can learn about God from what we see about Jesus? Well, the primary thing is this is a God of extraordinary, lavish, self-giving love. That uh, the thing we know about Jesus, he went about doing good, he went about healing people, he went about doing creative, extraordinary things, but that ultimately his story ends, one bit of his story ends with him being crucified and all the early sources say that this was the strange dark means by which the living God who made the world was going to deal with the evil in the world, with the darkness in the world, and doing so at the cost of his own life, his own pain, his own terror, his own, his own darkness. Um, and that, that, is, that is a picture of God which, again, if you started with perfect being, it might be very difficult to get to that, but the New Testament is front and center. Tom reverses philosophers' approach to the Incarnation. Philosophers start with God, often the perfect being kind of God, and then try to figure out, using philosophical methods, how the Incarnation would work. That would be my approach, but it is not Tom's. Tom starts with Jesus and sees a different kind of God, a God of love. Then all else is open and mysterious and requires trust. I do not like Tom's approach, because it is founded on faith, not on reason. But then reason, however brilliant, seems to end in implied contradictions, or at least in a lack of clear consistency. So the more I think about Tom's positioning, the more I respect its more limited ambition, fitting the New Testament facts and speculating no further. I see an even larger problem, the elephant in the room, what about other religions? I recall my conversation with the late philosopher of religion, John Hick. John famously had converted from a traditional evangelical Christian into a leading advocate of religious pluralism. We met at his home in Birmingham, England, a few months before his death. 
You see, there are several problems about the traditional doctrine of incarnation, which is that Jesus of Nazareth, the historical figure, was himself the second person of the Holy Trinity incarnate. Now, first of all, he himself did not teach this or presumably believe it. The only place in the scriptures where he teaches it is in the fourth gospel, St. John's gospel, which is very late. It's usually dated in, in the 90s up to the end of the first century. And it is so different from the others, which are called the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, that we have to accept that it expresses a, a much later development of Christian belief. They look back to the historical Jesus. Um, the fourth gospel looked up to the Christ of faith, mm. who is divine and consciously divine and omnipotent and all-knowing. The fourth gospel puts into Jesus' mouth things that uh, he never said. So I think we have to dismiss that and we have to realize that the historical Jesus did not teach that he was God incarnate. Now, the, from the pluralistic point of view, the second reason is that if Jesus was God incarnate, that means that Christianity alone among the religions of the world was founded by God in person. God came down from heaven to earth and founded it. And if that is the case, it must be, obviously, God's religion superior to all other religions. But this does not fit the facts of the actual products in human life, the fruits in human life of the religions, they all seem to be more or less equally good and equally lacking in goodness. <laughs> You're not saying the pluralistic hypothesis that all religions are based upon some transcendent real destroys the Christian incarnation. No. But degrades it to a secondary level. Yes. Well, let me explain this secondary level. The idea of divine incarnation is a metaphorical idea. I mean, for example, you might say that uh, Nelson Mandela embodies or incarnates the spirit of resistance to apartheid in South Africa. Mm. So it, it's a very natural and a very powerful metaphor. The, the idea of God being incarnate in Christ is likewise a very powerful metaphor. It's, but it's not to be understood literally. And I would assume that that does not uh, sit well with many believing Christians. No, it does not sit well with... <laughs> no, if you were to ask the Pope or the Archbishop of Canterbury or, or um, anyone like that, they would totally reject it. H how do you deal with the fact that they believe that fundamental fact so strongly? The fruits in human life of the different religions are, are equally good and equally lacking in goodness, too. And, and therefore, it cannot be the case that Christianity is uniquely superior to all other faiths. In 50 years' time, my guess is that Christianity will have split into two. There will be those who take the exclusivist view, who insist that Jesus was God incarnate, and everything that follows from that. But I think there will be another number who see Christianity as one religion among the others and who want to try to purify their own religion and want others to purify their, their religions. That would certainly make for a more harmonious world. It would. What I don't know if we would be any closer to truth. Well, that is the big question. <laughs> <laughs> On the Incarnation, while all Christian philosophers claim that Jesus was entirely human and entirely God, they stress different facets. For example, distinguish between nature and person, and between empowered by God and being God. Apparent contradictions can be harmonized, even if not quite sure how. Options beyond philosophy start with Jesus. Non-Christian philosophers incarnation as metaphor. I have questions, specific questions. If Jesus was entirely God and entirely human, what was his inner awareness? Could Jesus do literally anything, exercise actual omnipotence? 
How could a perfect being God, who is not in time, does not change and cannot be affected, become human, who is in time, does change and is affected? Were Jesus' temptations real? Could he have succumbed? During the lifetime of Jesus, did the pre-existing God who became Jesus continue to do what the pre-existing God always did? During the three days when Jesus was dead, was the pre-existing God who became Jesus affected? Did the incarnation experience change the pre-existing God? The incarnation may be the heart of Christian doctrine, but to be internally consistent, it must answer these kinds of questions. Internal consistency is necessary, but not sufficient to be closer to truth. For complete interviews and for further information, please visit closertotruth.com.